my world is foggy, but it it, it comes and it, it shows up there or it, foggy, um, but it shows up there. <laughs> yeah, so it, you, you're in and out of clarity. Yeah, yeah. And then when you have clarity, are you concerned? Are you worried? No, uh, I oh. No, he was, <laughs> yeah, he was not. And that's what was kind of, I don't know if it was scary or if it was sort of a relief. It, it did, I mean, have its positive side yeah. because, I mean, if he would have looked in the mirror at the time and seen what, you know, what all was going on with his body and his head and, you know, everything at the time, I think it would have been a little scary for anyone. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to Recovery After Stroke, a podcast full of answers, advice and practical tools for stroke survivors to help you take back your life after a stroke and build a stronger future. I'm your host, three-time stroke survivor, Bill Gassiamis. After my own life was turned upside down and I went from being an active father to being stuck in hospital, I knew if I wanted to get back to the life I loved before, my recovery was up to me. After years of researching and discovering, I learned how to heal my brain and rebuild a healthier and happier life than I ever dreamed possible. And now I've made it my mission to empower other stroke survivors like you to recover faster, achieve your goals and take back the freedom you deserve. If you enjoy this episode and want more resources, accessible training and hands-on support, check out my Recovery After Stroke membership community. Created especially for stroke survivors and caregivers, this is your clear pathway to transform your symptoms, reduce your anxiety, and navigate your journey to recovery with confidence. Head to recoveryafterstroke.com to find out more after today's show. But for now, let's dive right into today's episode. This is episode 174, and my guest today is Bill and Dee Dee Hernser. Bill experienced an ischemic stroke, and when the doctors treated the clot with TPA, Bill also experienced a hemorrhagic stroke. These days, Bill is recovering and is dealing with aphasia, which is worse when he's tired. Bill is the author of the book, I Just Can't Read My Own Mind, which tells his story and gives tips for stroke recovery. Now, just before we get started, there was a little bit of background feedback and background noise uh, from time to time during this episode. I've done my best to remove it for you, and uh, hopefully uh, it's still a pleasant listen, and you get a lot out of this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Bill and Didi Hernza, welcome to the podcast. Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm well. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for organizing this, and thank you for sending me a copy of the book. I just can't read my own mind. It's really interesting when I meet stroke survivors, because until I had a stroke, I'd never met anyone who was a stroke survivor. All stroke survivors have a story to tell. They seem to need to tell their story. It's really important. And then they also seem to want to help other stroke survivors, which is what I want to do. But I, I didn't realize that it was something within me and it seemed bizarre every time I met another stroke survivor that wanted to help somebody else not that not that stroke survivors aren't lovely people and they they don't like to help it's just interesting that they are going through their own turmoil and they want to help other people uh and this is the feeling I get from you Bill I get the feeling that it's really important to include other people in your recovery but before we talk about that tell us a little bit about what happened to you and then we'll go into the rest of the conversation um in my book um i wrote uh, i was a super dad a loving husband uh, a businessman and an athlete pause uh, pause, pause. Let me check with Didi. Didi, is that all accurate? <laughs> well, it depends on the day you're asking me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
sounds like today's a good day. So, Bill, we're going to go with that, mate. I think you did a good job in describing yourself. Didi agrees today. <laughs> go ahead, mate. Um, uh, ben, uh, out of the blue, um, uh, I had a visit severe. Uh, knock me down. Uh, take away my voice. Um, throw me into a wheelchair. Stroke. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He described it as as the perfect storm. He was on the wrong end of genetics. My brother and my parents had a stroke. And he would overtrain. Um, um, uh, I guess the bottom line is um, you hit 40, um, uh, you have to be more of a moderate uh, uh, by exercises, you know, um, moderate. Moderate. Uh, like any uh, drug, a, a potent drug, um, exercise too little, it does nothing. Uh, exercise too much, uh, and it will cause injury. Uh, In your work, stress overload. I, sure. I, I have to uh, uh, work on that. Still, you have to work on that still. Oh, yes, for sure, for sure. And um, he also survived a trauma, which, you know, they thought also might be the cause. Um, experience a traumatic uh, event um, what causes uh, physical, um, emotional, uh, and psychological harm. Um, the accident that I saw uh, may have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. yeah. I read that part in the book and it was pretty dramatic it was a uh, collision between two cars one car lost control ended up on top of another car there was yeah. a little there was a little child and a granddad in the car and as a result of that collision the child is out of the car but the other person driving the car imagine the granddad stuck in the car yeah. and then you're dealing with the whole situation and i imagine yeah. as a dad and as a person who has a father, you're putting yourself in the yeah. shoes of that child and you're going, wow, what, what, what's going on? These people have been impacted by this. And then you have to deal with that emotionally. And if you're going through a difficult financial time or difficult life experiences because you're mid 40, all the stresses of the world are coming together to attack you at the same time because yeah. that's just what... I did. That's what normally happens in that part of life, that midlife. Uh, then, then a traumatic injury like that is could be the icing on the cake for this terrible experience to happen around the corner. I completely understand that. Yeah. So it was about two weeks after the collision that you witnessed that you had the stroke. That was a normal day. You woke up. You went to work? Um, well, no. Uh, I, uh, I went, uh, I took my daughter to this dance class out of town. Um, uh, it was a uh, headache. Uh, uh, I think uh, Dee Dee will tell it to her. Well, he, because well, when, the night before, he, he had a headache, and that wasn't normal for him. But we had no idea that a severe headache is one of the signs. I, I, I didn't strong. have, uh, um, she had headaches all the time. I didn't. <laughs> but we still didn't see that as something that, you know, we should be, oh, you know, why is this going on? Um, so, you know, yeah, so he was, he was out of town. Running, yeah, yeah. Uh, in Austin, 
for instance, um, uh, I um, once I hit the uh, hospital, um, I was given a dose of tissue osminogen activator, a TPA, uh, to bust my clot. Um, uh, one in three uh, patients um, have major improvements. Um, however, um, six out of 100 patients uh, bleeding uh, can occur. And um, um, uh, long-term disability uh, or even the death. Um, I was one of the uh, one out of six, of course. <laughs> okay. uh, you went into hospital because of stroke. They gave you TPA to remove the clot, and then the TPA caused a, yes. a hemorrhage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and little did we know, you know, now that we have the stroke group, uh, a lot of stroke survivors were given TPA, and so now that's kind of had to become part of a vocabulary, you know. And, and they they say it was something with three letters that they gave <laughs> my mom, and we go, oh, that's a tissue plasminogen activator, you know. But then, um, you know, even to know what that is, of course, we knew nothing of that before stroke, like you were saying. You don't even, I didn't know of anybody with a stroke. We didn't know what a stroke was. We, you know, and you, you, you go day by day learning more. And For instance, uh, um, one uh, year and three months, uh, a, uh, my brother had a stroke. I, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so even though your mom and dad had a stroke, Yep. and your brother had a stroke, you still didn't understand it because nope. you hadn't nope. had one. That makes yeah. sense. Right, <laughs> right. And now and you understand it in a way you never wanted to understand it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's right on. <laughs> yeah. and, what about, and what about the TPA? Did you guys know the risks of the TPA or was that just administered well, I, before I was out anyone? Of it. I was out of it. Yeah, he, he didn't really get to decide about that, but... Um, really, I was I was in Laredo, and they called me, and you know they're telling me, you know, we're going to give him something to try to dissolve the clot, and you know, luckily we had just you know updated our will at that time, and I and I could answer, I could speak for him on his behalf, and um, and you know, I we got in the car, but it's a it's a four hour drive away, and so you know. The whole time, I'm really not knowing what I'm saying yes to, but I said, you know, if it's if it's going to help, if it's something you normally do, you did it. Please do it. it. <laughs> well, they told me it was the right thing to do at the time, and I mean, apparently, it was. It was yeah. whether whether it caused the bleed afterwards. It still was really the only choice at the time. You've got a stroke in. You got a blood clot in your blood vessel, causing you brain damage. And if they don't get it out, it's going to continue to cause brain damage. Yeah, right. If they if they get it out and you're not one in the one in six, then you're going to have a good outcome because the, I've never heard of anybody who's had a bad outcome. Of, of yeah. course, I've, I've heard about the bad outcome. I've heard that it does cause this problem for people, but I've never met anybody. And I've done 170 episodes and I know a heap of stroke survivors and Bill's the first person that I've heard who said that he had an adverse effect uh, from TPA. Um, so, Didi, where were you when you got the call that Bill's not well? I was, I was at home because um, I was sick, actually. And so we were debating the night before. He had the headache and I was sick with a cough and and um, we were saying, okay, who's going to take Allie, our daughter, to who's going to take her to her dance performance? And he said, well, you know what, I'll, I'll go and I'll go for a run and it'll be, you know, kind of a, a little release for me from the stress and whatever. And so, you know, I was home and then, of course, I had to hurry up and get over there. And, you know, mine was 
a, a minimal thing compared to what he was going through. And, you know, you just do what you got to do. But yeah, it was just a weird thing. We usually, I'm, I'm usually the one who goes with, to the dance stuff. He would go to the sports stuff with my son. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's where I was. Things were a bit Crazy. different that day. Yeah. And you, you're not a, you're a regular wife, you know, he's a regular husband. You guys have kids, you do the normal stuff, you know, it sounds like a pretty typical relationship situation that, you know, yeah. right. a, lot of, a lot of people experience, right? right? And then you get the phone call that he's unwell, but also that he's had a stroke and they're going to do no. those things. Well, I, well, you, it, well you actually, a stroke. yeah, no, the, when they called, what was weird is he what he runs and bikes competitively at the time that's what he he did so he took his bike with him and all they told me is he's had an accident and i in my head envisioned a car hitting his bike he flying off you know no clue what it was and they told me until you get here we can't tell you anything else. So that's what made it harder because then we had this four hour drive where we're just, you know, things are going through our, our mind of, of what it might be. And, a, and another bill, my <laughs> brother in law, he drove, drove, or, yeah. drove me to the hospital. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, drove me to Austin and to the hospital. So, yeah. Um, and on the way, we got the call that, you know, they wanted to do the use the TPA and all that. And so they were giving us a little bit more information. But like like you say, and like we mentioned earlier, is that still them telling me a stroke and telling me TPA, and I, they could have been talking Chinese, I mean any language, <laughs> and I, you know, other than my own, because I understood none of it, but I just had to go with what they were telling me was the best situation at the time. You know, um, so yeah, that was what happened that day. Must have been tough. I get it. Uh, I I was out of my mind. You know, I had, I had three bleeds, but the second one, particularly, I was completely gone. I don't recall it, and I just remember my wife coming to the hospital, and I I, I recognized her, but later on, I don't know how many days later, but much later, I recognized her, but at the beginning, I couldn't recognize her, so I was in my own world, Bill, do you relate to that, being kind of out it's of it? Uh, it uh, uh, my world is foggy, but it, it, it comes, and it shows up there, or it's foggy, um, but it shows up there. <laughs> Yeah, so it, you, you're in and out of clarity. Yeah, yeah. And then when you have clarity, are you concerned? Are you worried? No. Uh, I Oh, I, no. He was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was not. And that's what was kind of... I don't know if it was scary or if it was sort of a relief that he didn't know I, how I, bad I, he I think the doctors drug me up. Well... Yeah, they, I mean, they, they did the self-induced coma so that they could, yeah. you know, the brain, for the brain, brain swelling, but yeah. um, it, it did, I mean, have its, its positive side, yeah. because, I mean, if he would have looked in the mirror at the time and seen what, you know, what all was going on with his body and his head and, you know, everything at the time, I think it would have been a little scary for anyone. Yeah. How long did you spend in hospital, Bill? Um, I think, well, uh, two weeks, but I was shipped over to like, the to rehab um, uh, to um, Texas Neuro Rehab Center. For three months. Yeah. Okay. And um, um Do you want to talk a little bit about your craniotomy? Well, let me ask you this question. So okay. you're in hospital for a couple of weeks. You get to rehab. And in rehab, it must hit you that 
all these things that you used to be able to do before you can't do now. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Yeah. Well, What's that like? I, I, I thought it uh, it'll be two or three months now and I'll be okay. But it didn't. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think that was based on what he saw. His brother's stroke was on the other side of the brain. And so physically, he wasn't affected in the same way. He lost a little bit of um, his strength in his hand, but he could walk. He could talk. He, it was a, a completely different thing. So, you know, like Bill says, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to be like Eddie. And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks will pass by and. I'll be able to go to the gym again and I'll be back on my bike and, you know, it's all good. And a couple of times he did try to just pull everything out that the hospital had attached to him and just get out, of, hop out of the bed and realized right away that he couldn't. And, you know, then they actually just strapped him in like an yeah. animal. <laughs> but it was, it was necessary at the time. He really did try to get out several times. Right, right. So... When, when his brother had the stroke, how quickly did he get back to being himself? Was um, it a minor incident as far as the recovery or was it six severe? or eight months? Yeah, like it was like six months maybe or, you know, eight months. Um, he had, a, you know, he had a couple of memory issues sometimes and uh, you know smaller smaller things that I guess at that time you know when I think back it you know we really didn't realize how severe his stroke was he had several he had another one and then he had a couple of heart attacks since yeah. then since then so he he's, well, he's all good he's all <laughs> he good. can still you know thank goodness he can still you know do for himself and drive and you know all of that but mm -hmm. he was he was lucky yeah. in that respect yeah. did he write a book as well does he feel the need to talk no. about it all the time <laughs> no no he always he always jokes about you know the difference in the two strokes and 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 you know jokes about how you know Bill has the a lot of friends come visit and whatever, and he says, you know, yeah, he's the he's the one that wrote the book, not me. Yeah, because one time I, he said he was somewhere, and somebody said, oh, are you the one that wrote the book? And he said, no, I'm not the one that wrote the book. You know, and so yeah, sometimes it's hard, you know. But so anyway, competing against each other. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they've always been competitive their whole lives in, in athleticism. And even in, uh, they used to fly ultralight airplanes, both of them. And, um, you know, they would say, oh, I, I flew, you know, so many yards or whatever. Well, I landed on water and well, I, you know, whatever. So they were always trying to one up each other. Yeah. So they, Bill did one up him in the stroke, though, because his was pretty bad compared to his brother. Congratulations, Bill. Yeah, all right. <laughs> hey, um, in rehabilitation, what are some of the things that you had to learn to get back? I know you have aphasia, and that was a very big uh, part of your recovery. But physically, what else did you have to recover from? Five days a week, I would go... Uh, down to the um, 
um, the gym um, and I would work out for about one hour and um, um, it's okay. Yep. Are you okay? okay. Just keep, no. just keep trying. No, keep trying if yeah. you like. I'm just going to uh, wait. Oh, this yeah. is a really important part of the interview, right? Because we want to make people understand what it's like to have aphasia and to try and get through a sentence. So, like, it's really okay if it takes a while. I don't really mind at all. Okay. Um, uh, um, the. I can't think, you know, Vern uh, uh, would um, um, say, uh, hop on and we would go to the uh, uh, gym on a wheelchair and um, uh, uh, um, he would, uh, let me stay, and uh, the therapist would work me over. <laughs> Which side was affected, left or right side? Uh, the uh, right. right. And did you have a problem with your right hand as well? Yes. How far along have they come now? Um, well, I would tell you 85%, but it's a little bit lower than that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can show him, lift your arm. He can lift it. Yeah. But um, to open and close his hand is still not there yet. Yeah. So that was that was um, a lot of the therapy, still is. Yeah. Still, still works at that has not given up, never, never has been the type. Giving up is never an option, as he <laughs> says in his book, it's never an option. Um, and, and the walking, I think, being that he was a runner and being that he was a cyclist competitively, the leg was more important to him because he did not want to be in that wheelchair, um, you know, Meanwhile, he's in he's in rehab, and they're asking me, you know, what accommodations are you making in your home? And I said, well, I don't want to do anything because I don't think he's going to want to be in a wheelchair. And they said, well, I'm sorry, you can't take him home if there's not ramps and ADA accessible um, bathrooms and what have you. So we're in Austin and. Meanwhile, back home, my brother's trying to, he, he's an, he was an engineer and he was trying to make accommodations on the house. And you don't realize all the accommodations necessary. Yeah. You know, doorways had to be um, expanded to fit a wheelchair. And um, the one for this very office that we're in right now, which is Bill's office, and um, the bathroom door. And we had to take out a pull out a tub and put a roll in shower and um, the front door, side door, back door ramps because Bill's an outdoors person and I wasn't going to cage him in and just put a ramp only to the front, which is the street side. I mean, I knew he would want to be in his backyard and, you know, and be able to have access to the garage where his bike and his truck were. So um, those were those were huge accommodations for us yeah. because when he got home, as much as he was happy to see that we had made accommodations for him, it was it was hard for him. And as soon as he could, he wanted to like, can we knock off these ramps? Can we knock off? You know. <laughs> so those were, you know, those are huge for you know independence. And as as you're aware too, I'm sure you know that. Most stroke survivors, that's the first question they ask Bill, you know, when, when they meet him and they just had a stroke is, you know, well, how long did it take you to walk? And 
how long did it take you to drive and how long did it take you to, um, what else did they add? Um, uh, you know, did your vision, is your vision fixed? Can you read yet? And, you know. Um, it's a really hard question to answer because people want to know my story, but you're a completely different person and I don't know right. how yeah. my story is going to help you. But if I have to give you a timeline, if that's what you're really after, and that's going to give you some hope, then fair enough. You know, my timeline, I had three strokes over three years and brain surgery. So the, it was a really long timeline. And I only got really bad after the surgery. I only couldn't walk after the surgery. So I'm not sure how it relates to everybody else, but it's a completely different version of what happened. So sometimes it's not accurate for us to give our story, but I know how it helps other stroke survivors. What's interesting is I never met any stroke survivors soon after. We didn't speak about that. It wasn't a question that I asked, how long did it take you to get this back or that back? Because I had been three years in when I couldn't walk. Like it started nearly at yeah. the three year mark. So then it's like, oh, okay. By then I had met people who were five and 10 years beyond stroke. Yeah. And then it's like, uh, okay, I don't, it's not a question I need to answer. I'll come into rehab and I'll just do what I can and I'll get out of there as quickly as I can. And we, I got out of there in a month, but they thought that it was going to take at least two months to get me home. And then there was possibility of, how is he going to get up the front steps to his door, the front three steps? And they never talked about ramps or anything like that, which was great. Really? Yeah, really? because the progress was a lot quicker than we expected. And I'm not sure why, it just was. And the result was that even though I couldn't feel my left leg, I could walk holding on. I could walk to the, to the post on the um, porch. Yeah. I could hold yeah. on and get up and I didn't need a ramp uh, but it was scary we have a two-story home I didn't go upstairs for quite a while because that was scary to go up and come down because my knee used to give way mm -hmm. and then I would fall forward and I would do that <laughs> just standing yeah 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 Bill's laughing because he had several falls because he insisted on, on on doing things that you know yeah. were no, I have a two-story two house also. <laughs> yeah, it's scary, right? Um, ankle was rolling, the knee wasn't working properly, and it's the last thing I want to do is go for a tumble down the stairs. I mean, nobody wants to do that under normal circumstances, but after a stroke, you know, my head had the fresh plate put in there. Yeah, had it yeah, yeah, yeah. Scar. I yeah. don't like people touching my head at all now. <laughs> I don't like. I don't like seeing combat sports like boxing or anything like that it just makes my head hurt so yeah. I, I was really sensitive about falling but then of course at home I fell a couple of times once I fell onto my couch and hit my ribs on the arm of the couch that was terrible that was hurting for days and oh. days oh. and then I fell on the floor once as well uh, on the concrete floor and that was you know painful you did too. <laughs> you did too. Common, right? You can do way more damage to yourself by falling than sometimes yeah. the stroke has caused. The stroke. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Bill insisted on. Yeah. I think I'm ready to climb onto my two wheel bike, and I said, "Please don't do this when there's not somebody to stand on the other side of the bike." I said, "I'm on this side, but what if you fall the other way? I don't think I can pull you up." And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And and then he was joking with me because I was asking him how many fingers, whatever. And he was like, just laughing. And I said, you know, I started crying, of course, because I was like, you know, don't make me go through this. You know, it, it's hard. I, I know that, and then there's, there's tough stroke survivors. And then there's some that, you know, won't try at all. And, and I'm glad I have one that, that likes to try, but at the same time, it's, it's scary for me pretty often. Cause he, he really, um, he, he wants it bad and he'll fight for it, you know? I went for a bike ride about, I think it was about two years after I got out of surgery because I used to bike ride before. I used to love going for a bike ride and I got on 
and my left foot, which is the affected one, would slip off the pedal because mm -hmm. mine was just a regular bike. You know, it wasn't a sports bike for any particular events or anything. And it would, and then the the pedal would come up and scrape my shin. Right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. And it would be like, oh my god! I, I remember that when I was a kid, you know. And now it's happening again. So I tried and tried. And then I couldn't do it. I and then I went and got one stirrup, you know. So one stirrup to to hold my affected foot in the right position. So when yeah. I'm pedaling, it doesn't do that. It doesn't fall off, and then the pedal doesn't scrape my shin. So that was a great solution. Except what I didn't realize was that when I stop my bike, the foot that I lean down with is my left foot. And because I can't feel it and it's in the stirrup, I don't know that it's in the stirrup. So the bike <laughs> stops. I go to put my foot out. My foot doesn't go anywhere and I fall. Oh. And I did so you that. had to retrain, huh? I had to retrain. But of course, retraining is not easy. I oh, fell yeah. about three times before I said, I'm not riding the bike anymore. And the last time I fell in our central business district in Melbourne, I was riding through and there was a, a road closure because they were doing construction work. And I come around the corner and I didn't realize that there was roadworks because you couldn't see around that corner what was happening. And when I got there, there was a man holding a stop sign and said, you can't come here. And just as, as soon as he said that, I tried to stop really quickly and put my foot down at the same time. And all I did was fall flat on my face right in front of him. <laughs> it was terrible. And then I had to ride home um, you know, feeling all bruised and battered. And that was the last day that I rode a bike until I discovered an electric bike. Mm -hmm. but, so the electric bike helps assist in the pedaling. And therefore, my left foot doesn't get tired and doesn't slip off the pedal. And therefore, when I put it down, I don't have to have a stirrup on my on my pedal. And uh, I can put it down and I can ride under normal circumstances it really makes a big difference in assisting me yeah. uh, not not fatigue the leg so yeah. i'm very familiar with the experience of trying to ride a bike and falling over yeah. um, i almost before i bought the electric bike i almost bought a three-wheeler yeah. and this yeah. just uh, made it possible for me not to buy one not that not that I, I mind which bike I got, I would have got one that suited me eventually because bike riding was really important to me. And so is exercise, yeah. right? And you guys know how important exercise. Bill, you wrote about it in the book that exercise mm -hmm. is a really important part of recovery. So you've already spoken about exercise being a part of potentially creating the perfect storm because you overtrained, but it also is important for your recovery. So yeah, yeah. How much exercise do you do these days? Well, um, not near. Um, I three quarters of, uh, of what you would like. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, he has to, he has to really watch those words because he still does overtrain. When he rides bikes, he goes, he goes about 26 miles once a week. And, you know, I feel like that's a lot. I feel like he doesn't need to do that much, but he likes to. So it's once a week, you know, and, and luckily he rides with his neurologist. Yeah. So I can feel okay if something happens that he's going to be able to tell what to do. And, and so, and, and I think too, he'll see if Bill's getting fatigued and he'll, you know, yeah. he'll say, you know, let's call it a day or whatever. Um, but um, you were talking about the three wheel bikes and we do have some for our stroke group, the recumbent bikes. Bill had one initially because I had gotten it for him, but you know, for him, that was a baby bike, and you know he had to move to the two wheeler. But but he did ride it for a while, oh, yes. and it, it did help. And and a lot of the stroke survivors do use them because then we don't have to worry about them falling, and they're still getting exercise. You know, I mean, they're great bikes. Yeah. It's not. It's not all about you, Bill. I mean, you got the oh, caregivers. Yeah. <laughs> you have to give the caregivers a little a little bit of relief, you know, so that they yeah. can feel 
they can feel comfortable and at ease with you and that you're not going to go and do something silly again you know they need you to just relax a little bit and do things you know at a slower pace i know it's hard but yeah oh i to. like i like this bill i like, I like his, his idea of worrying about the caregivers because i try to tell him you know sometimes you have to think about what i'm getting out of it you know like because it it is very hard for the caregivers so when i can see both ways when you have a stroke survivor that's scared to do anything and then when you have one that wants to do everything because um we have uh several in our group that the you know the caregivers say you know he wants to go outside in his wheelchair and go through the grass and go through you know and you know you know that that's an accident waiting to happen you go through the grass and it just like breaks and then they fall forward and um you know then then you have some that you know, don't want to get out of the bed, you know, and, um, and both need a little, you know, talking to sometimes and, you know, both, both have their pluses by, by being motivated to do more and it, it, that's good, but not extreme, you know? <laughs> I know, I know Bill thinks about you, but what he's doing is he's going, I've got to find my limit. I've got to push, 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 find my limit. Oh, yeah. So I know where it is so that I can stop, right? And I don't know why, but I became acutely aware of my wife's role and what she was going through because I think I became more aware of it because just after, just before my brain surgery, her mum passed away. So mm -hmm. within a month, we had her mum's passing, the funeral, and my surgery. So at some point I became really aware that she as a caregiver is going through regular parts of life which are hard and difficult then she's dealing with a husband who's a stroke survivor which is complicated and difficult all at the same time and there's not a lot of time left for her she's a mum, by the way and looking after the kids and then she's looking after her dad now who's on his own and she's yeah. doing all these things. And at some point, I wonder, was she thinking, and she never admitted it, maybe she wasn't. <laughs> at some point, she was thinking, you know, I've had enough. Like, what about me? You know, like, I need some time for myself or something like that. Now, mm -hmm. what about you, Dee Dee? Did you experience that whole, um, that whole, I wish this didn't happen, of course, you wish it, your husband didn't become a well, but did you have moments when you felt like, you know, what about Dee Dee? Like we need time out. I need to rest. And oh, recuperate. Yeah. yeah. Um, we were fortunate in that our kids were old enough. My son was senior in high school and my daughter was in college already. And both of them, well, my son that was in high school, of course he knew he still had to finish, but my daughter, you know, said, I can pause my college, you know, classes and I can, you know, come and help you. I know that this is hard and, um, and new and, um, different for all of us, but, um, I knew that, you know, it was best for her to stay in school. And I, I said, you know, I, I'm from a big family and we live actually like on a compound, kind of like a ranch and have a sister next door and my brother and sister-in-law lived on the other side. And so I, I had relief, which a lot of people don't. And so that helped. But the part that was the most difficult was just the not knowing what to do. And so that's when we started looking for a stroke group and didn't find one and then decided, well, I'm going to study up and research and see if we can start it. And, I, and I'm glad we were able to because it helps so much. If I could recommend one thing to anybody who has a stroke is to get in a group with others, yeah. others yes. that, that have been through the same because yeah. it helps so much to say, okay, what did you do for, you know, falling? What did you do for the, the foot drop? What did you do for you know, the headaches or whatever, whatever it was that was going on aphasia. at the time, aphasia, yeah. you know, how did you, because at the beginning, I'm, I'm a, a kindergarten teacher for, for 33 years and I've retired, but I, 
I tried methods that I did in the classroom and, oh, let's sound the word out. Well, stroke doesn't work that way. We, we learned that right away. And, and then I, I learned also that I'm not supposed to be helping him say everything for him because he can talk for himself. It just, I just have to be patient. And, and so we, we learned a lot, trial and error, but um, uh, to say that it was not difficult is crazy. Everybody just needs to know that that's normal to, to be a little overwhelmed and it's normal to need other people and to say, okay, if they offer to bring food or if they offer to take your kids somewhere, you know, say yes, <laughs> because, you know, you do need a break. You do. You really do. Cooking can be really tiring. I yeah. found that's my biggest role in the household because my wife comes home after me. So when she's still at work, I'm preparing a meal, but that can take an hour and a half, two hours. That I find that really exhausting, but and I try to minimize the amounts of food that I cook so that, you know, there's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and that's it, you know, not too much of everything going on. So yeah, when people say to me, can I bring you some food? I'm like, yeah, for how many days can you bring me food? <laughs> <laughs> bring me as much as you want i'll freeze it you know whatever you just bring it um yeah. the book i'm surprised actually before i speak about this next thing that i wanted to mention was i'm surprised how long ago was a stroke and there was no stroke group in your community i don't get that is i have no idea I yeah have no we, idea. we have two hospitals and we have one big rehab and then, you know, there's, there's um, um, therapy at the hospitals, but they, they try to get you out as soon as possible, of course, because insurance and all. But um, our, you know, our, our town is small, but it's not tiny. What we have? Uh, 270,000 people. Yeah. So it's a decent sized town not to have a stroke support group, but um, we also heard that like our Alzheimer's group is, is just, they meet at the hospital, they talk a little bit and they go home. And we just didn't want that kind of a situation. First of all, we didn't want it in a hospital because a lot of people don't want to go back to the hospital. That, leave, that leaves a bad taste in their mouth <laughs> and they're really good one. So, you know, we, we worked around, let's make it something different. And all of our activities are non-clinical, just like you know, they play tennis or, you know, they go bike riding or they, you know, do art class and we try to take them other places and whatever. But that was the thing, building the stroke group from just having a meeting once a month has become like huge for us because, I mean, we had to get become a nonprofit and we had to really go beyond. And I'm not a business person. I, I told you I'm a kindergarten teacher. But Bill's a businessman, always has been, my daughter's business major, you know, so they both wanted it to be, you know, let's do more with this. There's so much potential, you know, there's just, you, you get the community involved and, and, you know, there's so much potential. But even bare minimum, if you have meetings and you allow them to talk, that's sometimes all they need. Some people only come to the meetings and don't come to any activities and still really get a lot out of just saying what they're needing, saying what they're feeling, asking questions. You know, there's just, there's, they, they're released from the hospital and then they just go, now what? I know we were, we were like, okay, we're home. What's, what's next for us? That's very common. Now what? Like, what do I do now? Uh, yeah. that thing that happens is is basically the doctors they you know they they stitch you up they fix you up they send you home and they make it your responsibility to take the next step uh and yeah. hopefully you have the physical <clears throat> capability to to take that responsibility on and if you don't hopefully you have a caregiver or family or friends to support you to take that next part of the responsibility that's the real interesting thing it's like we've done our job off you go into the world and that's yeah kind of the that's how i was released into the world you know back into the world it was like okay we're done 
we were just starting. We're not done. We are never, <laughs> never done. Exactly. We're just starting. The book uh, felt like that to me. To me, it felt like it was a. Um, it felt like it was a conversation, and somebody was asking Bill, "What do I do about this?" And Bill was going, "For this, I did this." <laughs> yeah. And that's mm. kind of what it felt like. You know, every part of the book had a a solution, I suppose, for a challenge that Bill faced. Mm -hmm. So it was yeah. really easy to understand, really easy to read. The words are quite large, which is really good. Like the, the writing is quite the large. Print. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah that's... <laughs> so you don't need reading glasses to read it. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes it really easy, which means it's quite a short book, even though it seems like it's a lot of pages. It's not a lot of pages. It's a it's a short book. And I, I think that when you're recovering from something as complicated as a stroke, I think it needs to be short and sweet. Too much yes. information can then overwhelm. Right. And create too many possibilities. And I and I just love the fact that there's not a lot of information in there. It's just important information. For this, I did this. This is how I did it. There's even your running schedule, like your mm -hmm. your gym set, your gym schedule, and all that type of thing. And it's like they're really great tools that I can look at and and adjust or run with or do similar things or do something different. Like it's great. Mm -hmm. What made you feel like it was important to write the book, Bill? Well, um, I started off by. Um, uh, um, crime uh, basketball book, uh, writing the basketball book. Um, um, uh, uh, it did. Um, I had a stroke and went from basketball book to a book about stroke. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and, and to give people a little taste of that, you know, pre-stroke, reading and writing are not hard. Yeah. Post-stroke, he thought, well, you know, the book will take maybe five years. It, it, we, we went on it, 10, it, you yeah. know, 10 years yeah. was the was the, the final number there. He, yeah. kept, he kept telling people, because uh, he would do a lot of public speaking. He had his... Um, his um, the videos and he would go to the university and to even elementary schools and kind of talk to them about what a stroke is and how to recognize the signs and that was really cool for the community and very well received I mean if if you've not done that I mean I'm sure you probably have with your podcast but it's so important to educate your community on what to do when someone's having a stroke, because, you know, people don't know, we didn't know the headache was, and we, you know, all, all the different signs. But anyway, when he would go speak, um, you know, he had his videos and everything, and it, it looked like, oh, you know, he, he doesn't have too much trouble with his speech, but then at the end, he would open it up for questions, and yeah. he would go, okay, oh, you don't have any questions, God. and well, that wasn't planned or scripted for him, so yeah. he was like, um, and he'd look at me, and I would go, uh, still can't read your mind, you know, <laughs> so, um, but, you know, it's really important for them to know, like, that there's a whole community out there, and the answers are out there, you just have to go find them, but you have to, you know, ask and know what to ask so hopefully the book you know bill used to coach basketball he coached our son from kinder all through high school and so it was he was passionate about it and now well, I, he he had to be passionate about yeah stroke yes. and so he had to just you know figure out what you know what all could could he do to make other people learn about aspects of stroke that maybe they didn't know and so I yeah. think, yeah, yeah. That's really important. I, I, for many years, I think from the first year after my first stroke, I went to the Stroke Foundation in Australia and I became involved as a Stroke Safe Ambassador and would go out and we'd talk oh, to yeah. people awesome. about stroke. Awesome. 
uh, what it is, how to prevent it, and what to do if somebody's having a stroke. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2013, and that program is still happening today. And people, uh, stroke survivors usually end up going out into a, a workplace or a community gathering or something and speak to people there. So that was quite good. And it was my first attempt at public speaking. And it was real fun to do. I got to meet a lot of lovely people. And they gave me encouraging words and all that kind of thing. And, and the Stroke Foundation made me have something to do some kind of purpose mm -hmm. behind why the stroke happened to me and mm -hmm. then that's it, ultimately what led to the podcast it was this talking about it which i didn't realize that i needed to talk about it all the time <laughs> and, I, and i still do and i don't know why i think it's definitely part of my recovery and part of my healing i get a lot more out of it now it's not more it's not just that I talk about it, the connection with people. I'm also, I also need people. I'm the kind of guy who needs people everywhere all the time. If I can get them, you know, <laughs> yeah. ring me up. Let's go out for a drink, a, a, a talk, a walk, a whatever. Let's just go somewhere. That's the kind of guy I am. So um, the, the, the stroke has, actually made me able to find more people that are like me that understand me that I've never had before because before I didn't know how to connect with I didn't have some one thing in common with people like I didn't have that and even though I've met more than 200 stroke survivors easily in the podcast there's 170 so I've, I've met way more than 200 stroke survivors but we are so different we have different political views, we have different backgrounds, we have different ideas, different thoughts, but we really understand each other when it comes to stroke. So we don't really care about the other stuff. We just care about the fact that mm -hmm. I understand you, like I get it. And I needed that. I needed people to understand me. I felt like the black sheep in the family. So I can appreciate why Bill does all the things that he does and why he uh, over commits to helping people and writing a book and all that type of thing. Because He's describing me like that's exactly what I do. <laughs> and, and, I'm just, and I'm just pretending to ask questions that I don't know the answers to. I know the answers to them. I just want to hear if he's like me. Weird. If somebody else, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I totally get it. What has been the feedback uh, uh, like about the book? So um, it's been out for a while now. Big book, almost 2000. Uh, 2,000, 2000 copies. Uh, and we live right on the border of Mexico. Just the river separates us. Seven. So we now have ta -ta -da -da, the Spanish version. Oh, so wow. we had to translate it because a lot of people around and even, you know, I have family members and stuff that, you know, speak a lot more Spanish than English. And so it was requested and we we got a couple of copies that we've already distributed and we've ordered more. So, yeah, so we're hoping to, you know, do that. And we, we've done, we've done several book tours around in, in cities uh, around us. Five, five, four, five, yeah. six, seven. Between the Valley and Houston. Yeah. yeah. Done, he's done seven book tours and, and got some more planned, but I told him to wait till after the holiday. No, so I, 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 <laughs> yeah, we, we need a little break. <laughs> But I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, that's the part that that he forgets about too is is to like sit down and close his eyes for a yeah. little bit, take a little break in the day. He he's gotten better about it though. He'll yeah. come home for lunch. And I I eat and just a little bit of uh, shut eye and and I'll go back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It really does help to reset and recharge the batteries and focus the brain again. It's really good to sneak in a couple of, you know, daily rests or relaxations, even if it's not sleep meditation, even for five minutes has a similar effect to sleeping. So it's yes, really yes. good that you can do it. So I'm really impressed by you, you guys. Um, you've come a long way. You've been through a, a, a heck of a journey and 
you've written a book about it to tell the story, to share with other people, to create a community, to make it easier for other people to navigate stroke. When I had the stroke in the first one in 2012, there was nobody. It was just the Stroke Foundation, which was still amazing that it existed. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't know of anybody anywhere that had had a stroke that I could connect to. And that was the hardest part. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's really important because we're the only people that can really support stroke survivors. Yeah, your neurologist can get you out of the hospital and your surgeon can get you out of the hospital. Yeah. And the odd occasion a neurologist will come for a bike ride with you that's yeah, <laughs> yeah fantastic. very odd yeah <laughs> but usually they don't get involved afterwards and that and the really important thing about that is is that they've never had a stroke thank god and that and therefore they don't really deeply understand it like you guys didn't understand when bill's brother had the stroke yeah right you, un you understand it now what he went through and unfortunately you had to go through this. So I suppose what I'm saying is you're doing a great thing and it's really, really important. Thank you. And Thank you. I'm Thanks. glad I'm glad that I uh, came across you guys and uh, that I had the opportunity to chat to you and get to meet you. And you know what? I don't know what the word is, but it's great that uh, aphasia, uh, people with aphasia, get out and speak on my podcast or at least try and speak or speak the way they can speak because speaking yeah. doesn't have to always be like this, right? It's different. This is the thing, you know, we talk about lately, we've been talking about diversity and all these different things to include in communities. Like there's people talking about um, having different body types and abilities at the gym. Of course, stroke survivors can't lift weights the same way that they used to. So there needs to yeah. be an opportunity for that as well. And there also needs to be an understanding that not only do we speak different languages, but because of things like aphasia, we speak in different ways. It's still communication, yeah. right? Okay. And a lot, a lot of people who experience aphasia won't come on the podcast because they're embarrassed by it or they, it makes them feel uneasy or they're upset or it frustrates them. I don't know what it is. But I've had about three or four people with aphasia come on. And it's like, it's really, really important to hear from them in their own words, the way that they can communicate now, because it's still communication and they need to yeah. communicate and we need to hear from them. Yeah. Yes. And they need to know, you know, um, I tell people for a whole year, Bill didn't talk, he didn't say anything. It was a good thing. He was a real good um, drawer and he would draw little pictures. He would, you know, when he was in the hospital, he drew a little picture and it was the lawnmower. And I said, oh, are you worried that the grass is not getting cut while we're over here? You know, because he was thinking about it. Hey, I've kind of been here a while. Who's cutting the grass at home? You know, and I said, don't worry about the grass. And then he and then he he tried to write his dad's name and it was just gibberish and and it, there was a D in there, but none of the other letters were correct. And 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 then you know his dad was older, and 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 it was that he was worried about his dad too. Like, do, does my dad know I had a stroke? And does you know? And so people don't realize that you know you meet other stroke survivors, and you're going, oh, that happened to you too. And oh, for a, for a year, we we found this guy that didn't talk for 20 years. He was 20 down, down, the, block. down the street. Yeah, yeah. and Bill. <laughs> Bill just saw him one day and followed him and said, oh, he walks kind of like me. Hey, his arm is kind of like mine and followed him. No, he, 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 what? Go ahead. He was in the store buying cookies. Yeah, and Bill goes, why is he eating cookies? You're not supposed to eat cookies. You know, Bill's all worried about his diet, you know, and I, I said, hey, you know, I eat cookies. <laughs> but anyway yeah i mean and and and, yeah, and he says that he he didn't didn't talk for about 20 years because he didn't know there was anybody else that was going through he, what he was going through and, and i mean 20 uh, years um i think uh um laughter uh laughter 
uh, in the book. It, uh, it mentions him. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, you know that, and, and there's there's just so many aspects of stroke that are relatable to other stroke survivors only. It's it's a little it's a little community of, of you know understanding and and. I, I would like to say this. Um, uh, uh, I. Uh, um, it uh, I I can't uh, uh, see out of this eye. Uh, uh, two birds with one stone. The the uh, stroke of my uh, brain. brain stroke and my eye stroke. And um, uh, it's in the book too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So there was a stroke, and then and then there was an immediately after. Yes, immediately after. Stroke. Yes, uh -huh, yeah. an eye stroke. I've never yeah. heard of that before. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. look up monocular vision, and ah, you'll find yes. you'll find all kinds of of people that have experienced. And then and then we found out that there's, I mean, of course, all the same ones that are asking when they can drive and all that are the ones that have the vision. You know the all kinds of issues and and it's it's so much more um, more popular than you think that a vision deficit will happen with a stroke and we didn't know and he had perfect vision before the stroke we had a bulletin board up on in his <laughs> rehab room and we put pictures of the kids and all his award for running and little did I know he could not see it at all. I couldn't see he, it. He, he told me way later, you know, about it. He says, by the way, that bulletin board you had, I didn't even know it was up there. You know, it's just like, oh, thanks. You know. <laughs> just trying to make you feel better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did read that in the book actually, the monocular uh, uh what did what was it called? M Monocular vision. vision, yeah. Monocular vision, yeah. Okay, so that's an eye stroke. Okay, that is interesting. I just learned something again today. So it is jam packed full of great ideas, great information, great uh, solutions to problems. And uh, it's definitely a, an amazing book. It's written from a stroke survivor. It's definitely for a stroke survivor. And it's for caregivers as well, because yes, yes. it's going to enhance the the knowledge of the caregiver really quickly so that hopefully and, it doesn't take a long time for them to find out answers that they need, uh, uh, questions, an answers, yeah. answers, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and the doctors uh, and the, the therapist, you yeah. know, kind of, kind of seeing it from the stroke survivor's point of view, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. and just people that, Caregivers in general, not only a stroke, you know, just overcoming adversity and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I, I wanted to say, uh, um, you and I, um, 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 you and I uh, will take uh, basketball, for instance. I'm, uh, um, uh, I'm I'm with you in it, uh, talking to you about it. Um, but you say off the 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 beaten path, and I think to tongue tied. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's you're a Type A personality by my small time i've got to know you right so in your as a, as somebody who is highly motivated highly um competitive um you know entrepreneurial uh physical next level amounts of you know physicality this has completely challenged you in every way oh before. yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah did it get dark? Did you have some days where it was really dark? No, I don't think so. I, no, no. I mean, um, in the hospital and in the rehab, he got frustrated really bad sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But I've never seen him say or heard him say, you know, why me? 
Um, I'm just, I just, you know, I, I've done everything right. You know, why is this happening? I never. And I mean, I've said, why me as a caregiver? But he's never, I mean, he's never voiced it and he's never acted like he felt that way. And that's been what's like, you know, my whole family, they go, you know, how can we be mad about this? Look at Bill, he wrote a book and he had a stroke and, you know, whatever, whatever. And so he's he's the the family motivator. But um, yeah, that's, that's, it's weird that you, you know, made, made, brought that question up because really we have not seen it and I hope it stays in wherever it is <laughs> I got a sense that you hadn't that's why I asked it because I got a feeling that he's the eternal optimist and he's eternal problem solver and solutions focused and anyway what good does it do to say why me and to get shitty I mean we right. I've done it a little bit it doesn't really help and it's good to do it if you need to do it and get it out of your system but the reality is, is it actually, it's not useful at all to do that. It just puts you into a spiral for some people, potentially yes. of a space where recovery is not happening. It's not supporting recovery. It's actually supporting the opposite of recovery. So yeah. Yeah. if you can catch yourself being there and snap out of that, then it's okay to do it every once in a while for a little bit. But mm -hmm. if you're staying in there too long, it's actually impacting your recovery. And it's sounds like what you need is more psychological support or more emotional support or more counseling or something to get to the bottom of it you know um you're alive you're a miracle and you're not immune from life life is happening to you and for yeah. some people life happens like it happened to us or it happens completely differently somebody can have a heart attack they didn't get the opportunity yeah. To say why me? Because they might be dead immediately. Yeah. So yeah. they're not going to know. Yeah. So we we have to take the approach that this is just part of life, and we're not immune to it. And who are we to think that life shouldn't happen to us, and that everything mm -hmm. should be perfect all the time? I mean, that's not how it is. Every single person that came before us who's passed away was alive and now they're not life happens yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and every single person that is born after us is also gonna pass away at some point in time and it's not always pleasant but it is the reality and i and um i i like that concept of not saying why me if if you have the 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 training to learn why it's not not a good thing to say but also if you have the instinct to not say it that's yeah. a great thing yeah. and for and for those people that have said it don't feel bad that you've said it it's okay but just know mm -hmm. that you don't need to stay there because it's not yeah. helping you in any way and lots of people with disabilities with the inability to speak because of aphasia with the inability to do all the things still achieve massive accomplishments in life just look at stephen hawking yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. If there was yeah. ever an example of what's possible, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. look up Stephen Hawking if you've never heard of him. You know, for the majority no. of his life, he couldn't yeah. move or speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone thought that he was some kind of a the most amazing scientist of our time. It's like, come on, guys, like we don't we're very capable and we have technology on our side which we which yep. generations yeah. before us did not have did not have exactly have, you know yeah so, yeah anyway that's my little motivational speech for everybody hopefully it helps. <laughs> <laughs> if you're sick of hearing me motivate you well all right i appreciate that too you can throw something at you can switch off or you can throw the, <laughs> the you know your mm -hmm. book at, at at the monitor whatever I don't mean to piss people off. I mean to just make people think about things that they haven't thought about before. Um, right. And this thing that Bill has done to to not do the why me, that's instinctive. For some reason, he's not doing it. And it's actually working in his favor. And isn't it amazing that some people yeah. are, bo are born with that instinct? Mm -hmm. Everyone else can learn it is basically what I'm trying to say. I know yeah. that took a lot of words, but that's all I was trying to say. <laughs> So, um, yeah, 
I love you. Uh, I love you reaching out. I love the fact that you guys have come together to be on the podcast. I mean, thank you so much for doing it. I wish you all the best. And I look forward to just following your journey on, uh, on Instagram, uh, et cetera. Uh, one, one, one thing, uh, um, we're going to do a book signing in your neck of the woods. Yeah. Well, we'll you gave yeah. us an excuse to go to yeah. Australia. Yeah. Well, we always wanted to go to Australia. So now that, we know somebody. Yeah. We're gonna go knock on your door and say, "Hey, Bill, we're here. It's the other Bill." Are you really? Are you really? We oh, yeah. we will. Yes. It's well, it might not be soon, but it it'll happen. I think well, in two years. No, no, don't give a date. Bill loves to give dates. He loves to give himself deadlines. But yeah. two but, years. Yeah. I'm holding you to that. So tell me, where can people find the book? Uh, where's the best place to go? Is there a website that they can visit? Yes, um, Book Baby is um, his publisher, and you can go to Book Baby and look it up. It's also on Amazon, and it's really wherever books are sold. Um, I know it's at bookstores also, yeah. but the best place is Book Baby. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. No, you're welcome. Hello. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.